Good morning, and welcome on this 6th of June, the second Sunday after Pentecost. We are using our Celtic service this morning, being as it is the first Sunday of the month, and we are going to begin with the territorial acknowledgement. As we gather here today, we wish to acknowledge that we are on land that at the time of contact was the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy and the Anishinaabe people. We thank all the generations of indigenous people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. May we who dwell on or visit this land also be good stewards, honoring those who came before us as we seek to move forward in truth and reconciliation. We come in this service to God. In our need and bringing with us the needs of the world. We come to God, who has come to us in Jesus. And who walks with us the road of our world's suffering. We come with our faith and with our doubts. We come with our hopes and with our fears. We come as we are, because it is God who invites us to come. And God has promised never to turn us away. Holy God, maker of the skies above, lowly Christ, born amidst the growing earth, spirit of life, wind over the flowing waters, in earth, sea, and sky, you are there. O hidden mystery, sun behind all suns, soul behind all souls, in everything we touch, in everyone we meet, your presence is round us, and we give you thanks. When we have not touched, but trampled you in creation, when we have not met, but missed you in one another, forgive us and hear now our plea for mercy. The creator of the world watches over you in your waking and your sleeping. The savior of the world ransoms himself for your sins and for your eternal life. The spirit of the world dwells within you to guide you and keep you safe. The God of love and mercy grant you the grace of pardon, wholeness and peace through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Come, Father of the poor. Come, light of our hearts. Come, generous spirit. By the glory of your creation around us, by the comfort of your forgiveness within us, by the wind of your spirit eddying through the years within these walls, renew us so that we come glad to this celebration. Amen. Amen. God, holy, God, strong and holy, God, holy and deathless, have mercy on us. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. 
Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain Jesus, for people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons he cast out demons. And he, called them to, and, and he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man, then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and in whatever blasphemes they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they have said, He has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside, asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother, my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. from my lips and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Amen. So, was Jesus crazy? Well, according to Mark, that's what Jesus' family may have thought. Jesus had returned home to Nazareth after his baptism and his early ministry in and around Capernaum. He had even called together a group of disciples with whom he could share ministry while he taught them. He's had some success with his preaching and his healing ministry, drawing both supporters and opponents. The question was, how would he be received in Nazareth, in his hometown? Well, people were saying he has gone out of his mind. The King James Version of the Bible translates the concern of Jesus' family in these words, he is beside himself. And Philip's New Testament translated, people were saying, he must be mad. The 1995 contemporary English version says, when Jesus' family heard what he was doing, they thought he was crazy. Most assuredly, Jesus posed a problem for his family when he came home. You know what it's like in a small town, and Nazareth then was a small town. You can't hide when your child proves to be an embarrassment. And it would seem that even his mother is upset by what she deems to be his outlandish behavior. This isn't the mother portrayed in John's gospel, the one who was there in the beginning encouraging Jesus to make use of his power to turn water into wine at a wedding. Remember that Mark does not have an infancy narrative. This is the first mention of Jesus' family, and we know next to nothing about them. Mark says that Jesus had a number of brothers and sisters, but his family plays a remarkably negligible role in his story. As far as Mark is concerned, Jesus' family is considered to be among the non-believers and even opponents of his ministry. They think he's crazy. For Jesus, family is that community that shares the common cause of the gospel, not necessarily the ones who share his immediate DNA. Mark records the family as being concerned that Jesus could get into trouble with the authorities, perhaps for disturbing the peace or teaching less than acceptable doctrines, keeping in mind that religious authorities and political authorities were often one and the same. 
The last thing a family needs is a religious fanatic who brings unnecessary attention to his family. They just wanted to drag him home, talk some sense into him, keep him safe, and keep the family out of trouble. But we mustn't be too quick to judge Jesus' mother and his family. They had good reason to be concerned. Remember what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount? Do not repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse, but on the contrary, repay with a blessing. And Matthew reports Jesus saying, the greatest among you will be your servant. How crazy is that? What the world calls wretched, Jesus calls blessed. Blessed are the poor and the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst that God's righteous justice must, might prevail. Jesus said, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. That was crazy. He prayed while folks were killing him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Conflict was not new to Jesus. Since sons usually followed the vocation of their fathers, Jesus, as the oldest son, should have taken over the carpentry business when his father died. But Jesus announced that he was going off to be an itinerant preacher. It isn't going overboard to suppose that any one of the family members would challenge him. And who is going to take care of the family business while you are off preaching? Or who's going to take care of mother if you don't? And what kind of a son are you? Conflict arose. And in his ministry, Jesus thought nothing of disrupting a family business with a terse, follow me, demanding that those fishermen abandon their aging father in the boat and join him as he wandered about with his followers. Jesus' invitation to hit the road must have broken the hearts of a number of first century parents who were counting on the kids for help in their old age. For Jesus, everything is subordinated to his mission. Nothing is more important than obedience to his heavenly father. But he appears to be so dismissive of family. The gospels tell the story that the chief focus of Jesus' mission was to reconstitute the scattered lost sheep of Israel. Jesus left his biological family in order to form a new family based upon the summons of God, Abba, his heavenly father. Jesus got into trouble for practicing a scandalously open-handed table fellowship, calling the lost and orphaned back home. This man eats and drinks with sinners. That's one of the earliest and most persistent claims against Jesus. Even as he was dying in agony on the cross, Jesus invited an outcast, a somewhat repentant thief, to join him and his family in paradise. In all these actions, Jesus was forming a new family. So, was Jesus crazy? And those who followed him, those who would be his disciples, are they called and summoned and challenged to be just as crazy as Jesus? Actually, we need some Christians who are as crazy as Jesus. Crazy enough to love like Jesus, to give like Jesus, to forgive like Jesus, to do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with God, like Jesus. Crazy enough to dare to change the world from the nightmare it often is, is to something, into something close to what God dreams for it. And for those who would follow him, those who would be his disciples, those who would live as Jesus, be like Jesus, well, are they not called to craziness too? Think back to the crucifixion of Jesus. Crucifixion was executed, execution by the empire for crimes against the state. It was an intentionally brutal means of capital punishment designed to send a message that revolution and revolutionaries would not be tolerated. So if you were a supporter or follower of the person being crucified, it was very dangerous to stand close by during the execution. The rational and sensible thing to do was to go into hiding or exile. Having said that, although most of his disciples had disappeared, there were some crazy enough to be at the foot of the cross. According to John's Gospel, Mary, mother of Jesus, was there, and her sister Mary, and Mary Magdalene, and his disciple John, into whose care Jesus placed his mother. Three Marys and John present and accounted for, that's discipleship. There were four who could say, 
I was there, I stayed. Now that was crazy. Now, it may not be obvious at first, but we actually have a day to remember crazy Christians. I think we call it All Saints Day. Though they were fallible and mortal and sinners like the rest of us, when push came to shove, the people we honor as saints marched to the beat of a different drummer. In their lifetimes, they made a difference for the kingdom of God. I believe there is a book being written to commemorate them called Holy Women, Holy Men. Or maybe even better, it could be the Chronicles of Crazy Christians. After Steve Jobs died, an old Apple commercial from the 90s went viral on YouTube. This commercial was attempting to rebrand Apple products, and its tagline was, Think Different. In the commercial, they showed a collage of photographs and film footage of people who have invented and inspired, created and sacrificed to improve the world, to make a difference. They showed Bob Dylan, Amelia Earhart, Frank Lloyd Wright, Rosa Parks, Thomas Edison, Martin Luther King Jr., Albert Einstein, Mahatma Gandhi, and on and on and on. And as the images rolled by, a voice read this poem. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs and the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them, but the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. So we need some crazy Christians. Sane, sanitized Christianity might just be killing us. That may have worked once upon a time, but I don't think it will carry the gospel anymore. We need some crazy Christians like the Marys and John at the cross risking the wrath of the Romans. And in our time, like Rosa Park and Violet Desmond, who courageously stepped up to challenge racial segregation. Christians crazy enough to believe that God is real and that Jesus lives. Crazy enough to follow the radical way of the gospel. Crazy enough to believe that the love of God is greater than all the powers of evil and death. We need some Christians crazy enough to believe that children don't have to go to bed hungry that the world doesn't have to be the way it often seems to be, that there is a way to lay, lay down our swords and shields, because every human being has been created in the image of God, and we are all equally children of God, called to be crazy like Jesus. Amen. I would invite you now to affirm with me our affirmation of faith, number one on page three in your booklets. We believe in God above us, maker and sustainer of all life, of sun and moon, of water and earth, of male and female. We believe in God beside us, Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, born of a woman's womb, servant of the poor, he was tortured and nailed to a tree. A man of sorrows, he died forsaken. He descended into the earth to the place of death. On the third day, he rose from the tomb. He ascended into heaven to be everywhere present, and his kingdom will come on earth. We believe in God within us, the Holy Spirit of Pentecostal fire, life-giving breath of the church, spirit of healing and forgiveness, source of resurrection and of life everlasting. Amen. For those following at home, the prayers today are not in your booklets. Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of glory and majesty, for you announced the coming of your Son who brings joy and gladness to this waiting world. Receive our prayers offered in the confidence that you are present 
working to answer the needs of your people. The response to Lord in your mercy is hear our prayer. Faithful God, we pray for a spirit of unity in the Christian church, that the, that the divisions between Christians may cease and the walls that divide believers may fall, allowing us to pray and to grow together as members of God's family. Lord, in your mercy. We pray that the leaders of the church may continue to spread the gospel with joy to the people of the world. Bestow grace and faithfulness upon Linda, our primate, Anne, our metropolitan archbishop, Susan, our bishop, and for all bishops, priests, and deacons. Renew the people of this congregation day by day. Give us generous and willing hearts as we seek ways of serving you and sharing your love with those around us. Lord, in your mercy. We pray that those who lead us and other nations of the world will always try to resolve issues in a peaceful way and intervene in the world's conflicts with forethought and common sense. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for a spirit of justice that God will hold those who are impacted by racism, marginalization, or violence, and lead us all to an existence of greater unity and equity. Lord, in your mercy. Compassionate God, support and strengthen all those who reach out in love, concern, and prayer for the sick and distressed. In their acts of compassion, may they know that they are your instruments. In their concerns and fears, may they know your peace. In their prayer, may they know your steadfast love. We thank you for your peace and grace for Cynthia, Ryan, Johanna, Lee, Gail, Jeff, Pam, Yash, Harvey, Jackie, Janet, Enam and family, Murray, Brenda, Debbie, Lois, Gladys, Julie, Wayne, Olivia, Norma, Dale, Myrtle, Lillian, Raven, Daniel. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we thank you for the lives of our loved ones who have died in your embrace. Grant comfort to all whose grief runs deep. Keep us safely in your son's faithful care. Cheer us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our O oh God, we come before you with pain in our hearts as we remember the children of the Canloop Indian Residential School we remember how they were taken from their homes by a system of arrogance that denied a good way of life. We remember the parents, the aunties, the uncles, the grandmas and grandpas left to grieve the empty places in their home. We pray that all children may once again sing and dance the songs planted in their hearts. May they carry the knowledge of their ancestors. We acknowledge those who left this earth Having, having heard no words of apology or lament. We are grateful that you hold these ones close. May they find in you the peace and rest that eluded them here on earth. And finally, we pray that one day this world will be a place where children are no longer harmed and will never again be removed from a mother's embrace or a father's helping hand. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious and loving God, grant that we may hasten to every town and home with the good news of your promise, O God, and proclaim the greatness of your name through our commitments and your peace. Amen. Teach us now, O Christ, to pray as brothers and sisters. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Son as the Messiah. May we hear his word and follow it and live as children of light. Amen. Our service continues for those following along with Eucharistic Prayer B on page 11. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, for you made us, and before us you made the world we inhabit, and before the world you made the eternal home, in which through Christ we have a place. All that is spectacular and all that is plain have their origin in you. All that is lovely, all who are loving, point to you as their fulfillment. And grateful as we are for the world we know, and the universe beyond our understanding, we particularly praise you, whom eternity cannot contain, for coming to earth and entering time in Jesus. For his life, which informs our living, for his compassion, which changes our hearts, for his clear speaking, which contradicts our harmless generalities, for his enduring presence, his innocent suffering, his fearless dying, his rising to life, breathing forgiveness, we praise you and worship him. Here too, our gratitude rises for the promise of the Holy Spirit, who even yet, even now, confronts us with your claims and attracts us to your goodness. Therefore, we gladly join our voices to the song of the church on earth and in heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And now, lest we believe that our praise alone fulfills your purpose, we fall silent and remember him who came because words were not enough. Setting our wisdom, our will, our words aside, emptying our hearts and bringing nothing in our hands, we yearn for the healing, the holding, the accepting, the forgiving, which Christ alone can offer. Merciful God, send now in kindness your Holy Spirit to settle on this bread and wine and fill them with the fullness of Jesus. And let that same spirit rest on us, converting us from the patterns of this passing world until we conform to the shape of him whose food we now share. Amen. Among friends gathered round a table, 
Jesus took bread and broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Later, he took a cup of wine and said, This is the new relationship with God made possible because of my death. Take it, all of you, to remember me. Jesus, firstborn of Mary, have mercy on us. Jesus, Savior of the world, have mercy on us. Jesus, monarch of heaven, grant us peace. He whom the universe could not contain is present to us in this bread. He who redeemed us and called us by name now meets us in this cup. So take this bread and this wine, in them God comes to us so that we may come to God. Christ, who has nourished us, is our peace. Strangers and friends, male and female, old and young, he has broken down the barriers to bind us to him and to each other. Having experienced his goodness, let us share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For those worshiping with us online and are receiving spiritual communion. Dear friends, I invite you in this moment, wherever you may be, to receive Christ in communion with the saints and the gathering of God's people, unseen and yet present with us now. Many are made one. We receive you, Lord Jesus Christ. We welcome your presence in us and together proclaim our love for you with our hearts, minds, our souls, and our strength. With the saints, we worship you. With the angels, we adore you. With your whole church, we proclaim your reign. Come to us, though many, and make us one in you. Amen. Jesus, I believe that you are present with us in the sacrament of bread and wine. I love you and I desire your presence afresh in my life. Since I cannot now receive the bread and wine of the altar, come spiritually into my heart. I embrace you and unite myself to you. Never let me be separated from you. Amen.
closing prayer can be found on page 17. Let us pray. O God, our Father, who gave to your servant Columba the gifts of courage, faith, and cheerfulness, and sent people forth from the holy isle of Iona to carry your word to all of your creatures, grant we pray a like spirit to your church even at this present time, further in all things the purpose of this community of St. Mark's, that hidden things may be revealed to us and new ways found to touch the hearts of all. May we preserve with each other sincere charity and peace, and if it be your will, grant that this holy place of your abiding be continued still to be a sanctuary and a light through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God fill you with joy and peace. May the healing power of Christ strengthen and save you. May the Holy Spirit encourage you. May a thousand angels guide your steps. And may a blessing from this holy place protect you all your days. Amen. Now time for the announcements. So, as you know, the lion's den has come to the end of another season. I took part last week in their last class and enjoyed myself very much with Kathy O'Shea and Tracy Croft and the lions who were present. So, we're not going to start up again until September 12th. That is the first day of the lions in the fall. We pray, we don't know yet, that it will be in person. We will have more information as that comes available to us for you. But during the summer, there will be five special summer episodes for the Lion's Den. And there will be more details about that to come. Please stay tuned. As well, you would have received last week, and I pray this week as well, that there are a couple of new videos that are Man behind the camera, Liam Croft has put together, behind the scenes breakdown and building the Bible. Building the Bible with Lego. There are more to come. I've seen behind the scenes breakdown, part one, and enjoyed it very much and look forward to more of those as we look behind the scenes and all the work that goes into these services and our tech behind the scenes. So. We continue with our worship online 
as far as we know, until the uh, bishop lets us know when we can come back, but be reassured that these services continue through the summer as well as the Thursday service. Go in peace and friendship and hospitality, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Stay.